How many of you guys are still putting down a lot of pressure on your tools, on your DAs? Like really putting good pressure down on there? No? No? Remember back in the days, they used to talk about putting down almost enough pressure to stop the rotation and then ease up a little bit? Anybody still doing that? Don't be ashamed to say, yeah, I do that. I mean, I won't pick on you too much, but I'm looking for somebody to pick on here. Yeah. You do that? Yeah. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> I just do it. Really back off. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, we're finding that with really good pad rotation, give it quite a bit of spin, ease off on that pressure, maybe even slow down on the speed of the tool a little bit. By the way, if you're not putting down as much pressure, nobody's tool will stall as easily. You're giving a lot more tumble to those abrasive particles, and you're going to get faster cut and probably a better finish, and you're not going to put any heat into the paint. Modern Catalyze Clear does not like heat. I still talk to old rotary users that still insist that they're heating up the paint and pushing it around. I'm flowing the paint. No, you're not. You are not reflowing catalyzed clear coat. Son Diago, keep your hand down on that one. I know you don't think you're doing it. And that's not my opinion, and that's not McGuire's opinion. That comes from the, the engineers of PPG Paint. And those guys know that stuff better than anybody does. Because they're the ones that make it. They're the ones that engineer it. You are not heating and reflowing clear coat. It's not happening. I can get enough pressure with my thumb. Okay. Keep that moving nice and slow. I'm not putting any heat in. How to use a system, techniques, all that kind of stuff. I like talking to people about what do you do when stuff goes haywire? What do you do when things don't behave properly? Right? We always talk about systems at McGuire's, but you get your technique dialed in. We've engineered the system. Everything's really good. You got the right pads, all that kind of stuff. Your technique on the tool's good. The car didn't take any training. The car doesn't know what it's supposed to do. The paint doesn't know how it's supposed to respond. What do you do when something doesn't work? Our microfiber system has limitations to how much cut it can offer, because like I said, that's not what it's designed for. So when that system doesn't work and you need more cut, that's when we start talking about going into our other mirror glaze compounds. What do you do in those weird cases, because you just nodded yes, when you go to wipe off the compound and all of a sudden it's sticking a little bit to the paint? You've used the same compound on 10 cars and it's an absolute dream, and all of a sudden on the 11th car it doesn't want to wipe off. What do you do? Change up your technique. How? How? Is speed reducing, maybe a different product, different okay. pressure on the machine. You could be generating just enough heat that, that that paint that's trying to suck everything out of it, you're hurrying up that process. We've actually found throwing a couple of drops of M205 on the pad at the same time will eliminate that problem on those weird paints where it's just trying to suck everything out of the compound, okay? Um, just, if it's ever doing that, sometimes that can help. Now, you guys ever notice also, as you're working your way around the car, if you're getting haze to begin with, your haze starts to diminish as you're working around the car. That pad kind of fully primes up and seasons up, and your haze diminishes, okay? You switch to a fresh pad, your haze comes back. So sometimes you just kind of need to let that pad season out a little bit. This paint is hazing pretty good. With a completely unseasoned pad. Can you catch that? Yep. That's that's fairly significant haze on there. This is the first telluride I've ever worked on. Quite a bit of haze though. I'll remove all your defects pretty quick and easy, but oh, they can haze up. Mm. Let's see, shaking his head, you're like, you don't even want to work on this car. Right? That gets that gets annoying really fast. Well, one-tenth of the yellow pad? 
I, most people at this point, they're going to go to their finishing college. They're going to go to 210. But I don't want to do 210 on the black phone. I want to do 210 on the yellow. And I'm probably not going to put a ton on here. Now, this is the fun part when the paint hazes. We can tell you all day long, use this pad, this liquid, and you'll get rid of the haze. And on some cars, it'll probably work, and on others, it might not work right away. So you always have to experiment. The big, the big variable in all this is always the paint. You do the same process, like I said, on 10 cars in a row, and you look like a rock star every time. That 11th car throws you for a big loop. Sometimes it takes very little product. Other times it takes a fair bit more. There is no secret weapon to this. You're always going to have to experiment just a little bit. I'm only going to go over half of this area. Normally, and I'll, I'll be completely honest with you guys, normally when I'm doing a demo like this, I'll come out ahead of time and I'll play with the car and get a feel for how it responds. I didn't have an opportunity to do that today. So that's a little bit on a wing and a prayer right now. <laughs> I'll slow the tool down slightly. Am I unplugged? Oh, I stepped on that one. Yeah, that's a problem with most electric tools. If you don't have a free flow of electrons to them, they don't do an awful lot. <laughs> You guys see that I did not prime that pad and I just put like three or four little drops of product on there? Okay. So looking in through here, don't look down here where I didn't quite hit it. But you look over here, right, we've got a massive reduction in that haze, there's probably still a little bit of it left. So if I need to, if I need to tweak things ever so slightly, maybe a little more pressure, maybe a little less pressure, maybe even a stiffer path. Um, again, I don't think any of our marketing guys are in here, so I can probably get away with saying this. I like to deal in realities. Okay, how many of you guys are using Meguiar's foam pads day day in and day out when you're working? Okay. How many of you are using Rupes foam pads on your Rupes DAs? Okay. How many of you are using uh, Lake Country or Buff and Shine? I'm not offended by any. Okay. I don't. I don't expect that anybody uses 100% of one company's product. And that's all they ever use. That's just not realistic. That's just not realistic. We understand that. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. We know that. The yellow Rupes pad, foam pad, with 210 is kind of a killer combination. The stiffness of that pad and the cell structure of that pad seems to work really, really well with 210 for removing haze. Uh, I know Lake Country and Buff and China have stuff that's similar to that. Um, the closest thing that we have would be our cutting pad. And this is when people kind of freak out. I got haze with my compounding step, and now you want me to do my finish polish with a cutting pad? Sometimes, yeah. Because again, the paint, the paint didn't get the memo. The paint doesn't know that this is weird. Sometimes you have to do weird stuff. If I had a pearl white car with fairly hard paint, 110 on microfiber, and that thing would be glowing. You probably wouldn't even think about doing a finishing polish on it. Non-metallic black, BMW jet black, is that the worst stuff to work on? Right? Everybody seems to hate that when you go online. Jet black BMW, you can never get them to finish out. The single hardest paint I've ever worked on was a jet black BMW. M105 on a microfiber pad didn't touch it. I mean, literally did nothing to it. It looked like it poured water on it. I had to go with a rotary, with a foam cutting pad and M101, 
at 1800 RPM and pressure. I, I worked on the Prince of Persia Bugatti at the Pearson Museum down in the vaults, an $18 million car. I worked on Steve McQueen's Jaguar XKSS at the Peterson. It's like a $30 million car. This BMW that I did is an older three series. It's probably worth five or six grand. It's the only car I ever worked on that scared the daylights out of me the entire time I was working on it. Rotary foam pad, 1800 RPM and pressure. Are you kidding me? That's stupid. The paint loved it. Nothing else touched it. That's one car I wish would have gotten the memo. All right, I'm going to hit the other side here. This is 210 on a foam cutting pad. Without priming it. And again, to be completely candid with you, I'm still experimenting right now. Because I didn't get a chance to do this before we came in. But when you guys are working on a car, that's why you do a test spot, right? Unless you've worked on that car before, if it's you know, repeat business with a client, and you've got your notes on the car. You look from here to here, there's actually less haze yes, with the foam cutting pad than there was with the polishing pad. I can guarantee you if I'd have done a section with the foam finishing pad, there would have been still more haze. It sounds completely counterintuitive to everything that everybody, including McGuire's, teaches. The car didn't get the memo. When, when the paint's weird, sometimes you have to do weird stuff to overcome it. Okay. Um, you think the paint here is bad, go to Southeast Asia, even Mercedes Benzes that are built in Vietnam, they ship all the parts over and then they assemble them. But they paint them in Vietnam. And the paint is insanely soft. And one of the things that, that I kept getting asked when I was in Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam was, how do we deal with these really soft paints? And these guys were historically going in, loading up the polish with a soft pad, and just going at it over and over and over again, trying to get rid of the haze. And I did this with a cutting pad. And 210 wasn't out yet. We used 205. And the haze was gone. And they all just went, you mean it's easier than what we were doing? The paint doesn't like to be touched. So stop massaging it and making love to it and going over and over and over and over. It doesn't like to be touched. Stop touching it. Why is stiff pad and not a soft pad? Ah. Softer pads will move around more. They'll bounce a little bit, actually. They've got, there's more, think of uh, your shock absorbers and springs on your car. Softer. Yeah, what happens when your shocks blow out and they're not controlling the rebound of the spring anymore? The car's bouncing down the road like this. Really soft foam pad is like a spring without a shock absorber to dampen the recoil. And it's bouncing against the paint. And it's doing this. And this is paint that's so touch sensitive, it doesn't like anything touching it. And you're basically doing this to it, and then you're just massaging it over and over again. That paint the whole time is screaming at you. It hates it. You get a nice stiff pad, you get good solid contact, you get in, get out real quick, that paint levels out, and it's like, oh, God, that was great. It seems counterintuitive to everything that we've all been teaching you guys. We designed that product specifically for those really soft, touch-sensitive paints, but it's still get in, get out quickly. The abrasive's not diminishing, it will keep cutting. That paint residue coming into your pad is gonna start causing problems. You can get in and get out really quick. I did a Ferrari 488 just a couple of days ago. Marketing guys are still going. Rupes yellow pad with 210. <laughs> and I could cover big areas and that paint looked did a full panel wipe with it, make sure I'm taking everything off. Okay, we're not hiding anything, we're not, it's not a bunch of fillers that are concealing stuff. You can panel wipe it and put a coating on afterwards, not a problem. Okay. Or, anybody try that juice yet? Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, that all sounded really positive. Who didn't like it? Who used half a bottle on a car? <laughs> Who 
Who wants to go back there. to the left? Why'd you use half a bottle? Just spray it on. Just keep going forward. Yeah, okay. So, here's how this product spreads. When we were testing this on a four door vehicle, we'd spray it on the front door and then we'd pressure wash from here, which was a mistake in testing. We could, not testing so much as development. We'd spray it that way and it would carry it across the back end of the car. And all of a sudden we got crazy water beating on the back door. We never applied it to the back door. We spread it across. On this hood, I would probably do three trigger pulls. That's it. That's it. Let me tell you a little bit about how this stuff works. Okay, this is notwithstanding the YouTube video that said this is water. Uh, because the MSD sheet, the SDS, didn't, didn't tell how much SiO2 was in it. And it has to tell you that because SiO2 is dangerous. It's a hazardous material. Anybody ever use um, powdered coffee creamer? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, look at the ingredients. SiO2. You're eating the stuff. <laughs> SiO2 in a powdered crystalline form that goes airborne that you breathe in is hazardous. SiO2 in other forms goes in your non-dairy coffee creamer. It's in your toothpaste. You can eat the stuff. That does not have to be on an SDS. If that's the kind of format that we're using in this, I'm not going to say it is, I'm not going to say it isn't, but if it didn't have to be on the SDS, it ain't going to be on the SDS, ladies and gentlemen. Understand what an SDS is all about before you go making YouTube videos about it. By the way, ceramic coatings, glass coatings, SiO2 technology, this is not a coating, by the way, but it does have silicon dioxide. SiO2, if you take pure SiO2 and you melt it down and you lay it flat and you flash cool it, you know what you get? Glass. You also get ceramics that way. Did you know that glass and ceramics naturally are very hydrophilic? They attract water. Water will lay on them in a big sheet. So how come these coatings and this stuff bead water with up to 110, 111 degree contact angle. If naturally SiO2 is hydrophilic. Yeah, see? This is the kind of stuff nobody else wants to talk to you about. SiO2 is the foundational technology that lets us do other cool stuff like crazy hydrophobic characteristics thicker builds, because when you're using carnauba wax or a synthetic sealant, you can't do an ever-increasing film build because it, it either a fresh application of carnauba wax, the solvents break down the existing carnauba, or synthetic sealants, they can't stick to themselves. The, the act of wiping it with a towel will exfoliate it and take it off. SiO2 has a lot more attachment points to the paint. It doesn't actually bond to the paint. You talk to a chemist about bonding, and in their mind, it's the sharing of an electron. Not to get too deep with this, but a catalyzed clear coat will not give up an electron, so nothing will truly bond to it. But there's a lot more attachment points, and it's a much stronger attachment, and it's a much thicker film build. So, if, And it's also a more abrasion resistant, I'm not talking scratch resistant, I'm talking like exfoliation resistant. Wiping it with a towel doesn't take it off. So it's thicker, it holds on better, and it resists that, uh, the physical wiping against it from breaking it down. So of course it's more durable. And when you're wiping on a coating, you're putting it on a whole lot thicker than you are a wax or a sealant. You're also only doing a couple hundred nanometers, so it's not all that thick, really. So what this does is, you think of a carnauba wax that you spread on the paint, you let it dry, you let it haze up. That haze is the carrier ingredients drying up and the rest of the carrier ingredients have evaporated. You wipe away the carrier ingredients and you're leaving the actives behind, right? That's how carnauba wax works. You do synthetic polymers, you've got carrier ingredients and active ingredients. A lot of synthetic polymers, you can wipe them on right away. The synthetic polymers will grab onto the paint 
you can wipe away the carrier ingredients immediately and you still have protection left on the paint. Carriers and actives. The way this works, the active ingredients are very hydrophobic. They hate water. The carrier ingredients are very hydrophilic. They love water. They want to grab onto it. You spray this onto a hood that's got a little bit of water on it. Not a big sheet laying on it, but a little bit of water on it. Spray this on. The actives will try to grab onto that paint immediately. The carrier ingredients are just sitting there. You hit it with a hard spray of water, you break them apart. The carrier ingredients grab onto the water as it's flushing off. The actives hang onto the paint. They don't want to be anywhere near the water. If the water is laying in a great big sheet on the hood and you spray this on, those active ingredients are trying to run away from the water. They're trying to go up and away from it. So when you then rinse it away, you're rinsing everything off. So if you've got already a big sheet of water on the hood, you spray this on, rinse it off, and you're like, wow, there's almost no water beating. This stuff's no good. That's why we talk about doing that foundation layer first. Okay, you can get that hood wet, it's a big sheet, you can take your hand and wipe a bunch of that water. Spray this on, dry it with your drying towel. You can then immediately re-wet the hood. You'll notice an increase in water beating. Do a couple of trigger pulls on the hood, hit it again with your pressure washer, your water beating will jump way up from there. Like one right after the other. It's a noticeable improvement in water beating. Noticeable. And in slickness. And in ease of drying and an ease of cleaning later on. Do not overuse this. Spraying this on to cover the entire hood of the car is kind of the same thing as taking your can of carnauba wax and scooping it out. Now you get how bad it is to just hose this on, right? Nobody in this room would take their carnauba wax and scoop it out of a can, would you? That's the equivalent of taking this and hosing it on the panel. Don't do it. This will spread like wildfire when you rinse it off. Pressure washer is the best way to go. If you don't have access to a pressure washer, get one of those nozzles that's got the little, little selector dial on it and go to the flat fan spray. Don't do the hard nozzle spray. Do the flat fan and let that hit the paint at a nice sharp angle. You'll split the carriers from the actives and it'll work like a champ. It needs to be applied to a wet vehicle. SEMA this year, we've got a lot of really, really cool stuff coming out in the pro space that I think you guys and girls are going to do. Really cool stuff. How much time do we got left? What time do we have? Got another 10 minutes. Well, 10 minutes. Questions on this or anything else? Question. Sure. When you spray that down, do you, do you spread it out or you just hold it down? To create the foundational layer the first time you use it, we would recommend that you spray it on onto a wet car, right? You've washed the car, you rinse it, spray it on, and then take your drying towel and just dry it, okay? Just like, a, think like a wax as you dry paint. Well, most of you guys are probably using, you use a quick detailer or a spray wax, you refer to it as a drying aid. Right, okay. On black paint like this, you wash the car, rinse it off, leave it wet, spray it on, dry it, you may see some light streaking. Get it wet again, a couple of trigger pulls, Hit it with the pressure washer, it'll dry like that, and there won't be any shrink. I had a friend in Northern California, this first came out, I sent him a bottle. He called me up and said, uh, look man, I just did my car with it, and it's streaking quite a bit, and I can't get rid of it, it's driving me nuts. I said, Josh, how much did you use? He said, half the bottle. <laughs> I said, okay, you're too far away for me to get up there this afternoon and smack you upside the head, but I kinda wanna do that to you right now. He goes, but it's going to rain this afternoon. I said, great, park the car in the rain. But I just washed it. I, just put it. I said, park it in the rain. The act of it raining on the car pulled away the last of those carrier ingredients that he overloaded on. He came back out, dried the car, called me up and said, oh my God, this is incredible. I said, now you only have enough left in the bottle to do probably seven or eight more cars. Stop using that much. Oh my God. The number of phone calls that we get, people complaining about this, it's always streaking. And when our guys in the call center push them, we've talked to people that have used an entire bottle on one car. <laughs> 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 
Stop it! Oh my, I mean, first of all, thank you for like using that much, but anybody that uses that much ends up not liking the product. They're not gonna go buy it again. They're not gonna tell their friends how great it is. We don't want you doing that, okay? It will spread like wildfire. Really, really easy to get out there. Jen, do you have a question? I do. Um, what about the borders between heat protection film and, and, brush, and paint? What about it? Anything. Is it, is it, is it going to be Is this going to be different? Is it going to... Is it going to be seamless? Is it going to dry white? Is it going to stain all that stuff? Okay. You'll never know. It's, you'll, all you'll do is get a bunch of beating on your paint protection film. It probably won't last as long on the PPF. It won't last as long on glass or plastic, but it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to cause any problems. It will increase water beating, but not as long as it will on the paint. My name is Jason Rose. work for Rufus. I used to work for McGuire's, that's what a lot of you recognize me for. I was there for 20 years, great company, great product. I moved to the Rufus team four years ago, and I moved to Denver, and uh, very happy. I'm happy, happy here. Uh, but it's also awesome to be back here in, in uh, California with all of you. All right, so when they asked me to come and speak with you, uh, they said, we, we want you to completely machine polish a whole car to get it ready for the, uh, uh, the paint coating application after my class. Um, so since that's not going to happen, we're going to plan B, which is I've prepared a very special presentation for you. So this material, you are the first audience to get this. Uh, I travel around teaching shining and paint all over the world, but this material I'm about to present to you is brand new, never been presented to an audience before. So, if you like it, I'm happy for that. If you don't, then I apologize ahead of time. But it's all new stuff. Before I get started, I want to talk just a little bit about Rupus, the company, just a couple of minutes here. So, it is pronounced Rupus. In case you were wondering how to say the name, it is pronounced Rupus. And if you roll the R, the, the Italians really appreciate that. I don't know how to do it. But it is an acronym. I thought it was a family name at first, but Rupus is actually an acronym. This is um, what it's, it says in the Italian language. This is what it means in English. It sounds so much sexier in Italian but it literally translates to a manufacturer of specialty pneumatic and electric tools. Our tagline for our company is innovation, technology, and design. So, everyone repeat after me. Say the word design. Design. Congratulations, you speak Italian. Because <laughs> it's just, it's a city word in English. Um, so that's our tagline. Now the company has been around since 1947. It's actually relatively new in the United States. Less than six years the brand has been in the United States. But 1947, family owned and operated business. It's in the third generation of the Valentini family. Which uh, it sounds, it sounds like Italian mafia, but it's not. Um, so over the uh, years, there's been some innovative firsts in the tool category. So in 1951, the very first orbital electric sander, the very first one came out of Rupus, Italy. In the 1961, uh, the very first hand tool with plastic body parts. And think about your hand tools now, the stuff at home and the stuff in your shop, everything is plastic body parts now. The very first one came out of Rupus in 1961. Then in the mid-1970s, the very first palm sander, which of course palm sanders is very common nowadays. In the mid-1990s, the very first gear-driven orbital sander, which now has evolved into polishing, as some of you know. And then what most of you know our brand for is our large orbit ram orbital polishers called the Bigfoot. Uh, that was a new innovation um, in 2008, it was the very first large orbit, it was 10 millimeter at that time. And then um, in 2010, the Bigfoot tools that you guys know now. And then of course the Nano, which a lot of people call the Iber, but it is actually the Nano uh, with hybrid technology. So the hybrid technology speaks to the 
battery power and the option to run it with a cord. So if you're interested in that, we have that next door. But this is the uh, nano with hybrid technology. Come on in, guys. There's a couple of seats up here. Thank you. So um, Rufus has a company. We have two major headquarters. We have our uh, major headquarters in Milan, Italy. And this is only one of many buildings. There's a whole campus of buildings, manufacturing going on all over the place. This is our brand new facility in Denver. My office is right there. And that's where our new uh, Bigfoot Car Detailing Academy is. So if you ever find yourself in Denver, please come on by. We do classes all the time. Check our website. But we also manufacture there. So the Bigfoot polishers, both pneumatic and electric, are manufactured in the USA as well as in Milan, Italy. All right. We also have education, and education is a big part of our company. These are online webinars. They're free, available to anybody that wants to see them. Uh, we do these on a regular basis. They're about quarterly. We're trying to do a monthly, but a different topic every time. And if you get on our email blast list, you will find out when those webinars are. And I would encourage you to go to our website rufususa.com and uh, register your email address to get these announcements. Now, these are global webinars. So they're, it's a live presentation that's presented to the world. So they're at weird times, like we're doing one next week and it's actually 7 a.m. for California. But register by email before the webinar. And then if you cannot make the live showing, <coughs> after the webinar is over, you will get an email with a link and you can watch it on demand at any time. But you only get that link if you pre-register. Yep. All right, here's how to reach um, Rubus. Here's all our contact points, our uh, email websites, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Here's how to get a hold of Rufus in any way. All right, so many of you know that we make polishers, but some of you may not know that we have complete polishing systems, including the liquid pads and tools for rotary, for gear-driven, and for random orbital. So these are three complete polishing systems that we offer. So whatever your flavor is, whatever your preference is, We've got a complete system for you. Um, here is the rotary. Again, it's the liquids, pads, not just the tool. But we have a mid-size compact. It's actually next door if you want to check that out. But it's, a, it's kind of a small, lightweight rotary. And we also have liquids and pads that are tuned for the rotary system. We also have a gear-driven tool that is orbital and rotary together in one tool. Again, very specific liquids and pads for that movement, called the melee system. And it is a force rotation gear driven orbital. You're welcome to try that next door as well. And then of course you know us for our random orbital Bigfoots. Um, this is guaranteed no swirl marks and less risk on polishing paint, but also a more efficient process, meaning that you can achieve one step polishing on, on the car, so you can get paint direction in one step. Um, so there's our three systems. Now here's the fun part. Um, you've heard of David Le Letterman, right? You know David Letterman? He's got his list of 10, 10 best, whatever. But I was thinking of uh, my best uh, 10, but I came up with more than 10, so I'm better than David Letterman, because I have 13. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working. So we're going to present to you 13 ways to F up your dual action around the marble polishing. Now because this is a family friendly event, what I mean by F up is we're going to fudge up the paint. Um, so things are in other words, but we're going to say we're going to fudge up the paint. So 13 ways. And I'm kind of using reverse psychology, so I'm teaching you something about random orbital polishing. 
but using reverse psychology. So, starting with number 13, best way to F up your random orbital policy. Hose on too much compound. Uh, if you are, how many of you uh, use random orbitals now of any kind? A lot of you. Okay, so you can relate very much. If you hose on the compound and use a lot of product, um, you can use more or less based on your climate, or the paint type, or the surface temperature, or your skill set and your user experience. So the, the key thing about this with too much compound is there is a sweet spot. Now with random orbital polishing, I guarantee you most of you are using too much product. And it's not a waste issue that I'm telling you this, it's a performance issue. With random orbital movement, there is just the right amount of compound that gets you what we call peak performance. It's not too much, it's not too little, but it's just enough. And if you use too much, you will do what's called pad drag. You'll create friction on the pad, and you'll also reduce cut and reduce finish. It also does waste compound, but we're talking about performance. So if you think about the amount of compound that you're using right now, and I don't know what that is for each of you, but whatever it is, Cut it in half and try that. And then cut that in half and try that. Because what I see traveling around the world is people are using way, way too much compound and you're not getting better performance. You're actually reducing your performance. So that was number 13. Number 12, another one about compound. If you happen to long cycle your short cycle compound, well, what do I mean by that? Well, all of these compounds on the market, they have built into them a certain polishing cycle. The chemist created it. Now, whether the marketing team tells you or not, it's built into the bottle. So a lot of you know this because if you use a product that gets dusty, that's hard to wipe off, and dries up really fast, anybody experience that? <coughs> That's a terrible compound, right? No. It could be the best compound in the world, but you have overworked the compound. So if you experience drying up fast, dusty, and a hard wipe off, you probably have a product that is intended to be what we call short cycle. That means six passes or less. Write that down because it's on the test. <laughs> You didn't hear about the test? Oh, so there's no test. Six passes. A pass will define what a pass is. Start out on one side, move the tool to the left, move it back to the right, that's one pass. So a six pass application. Most short cycle compounds are intended to be used at six passes or less. And it may not say on the label what it is. So. Uh, you have to experience this. Now, if you use a long cycle compound, it has many passes to it and it still stays wet, that is a long cycle compound. And you can actually short cycle those products or you can long cycle them and it works okay. But, you're in trouble if you take a short cycle compound and you overwork it. You will um, hurt your finish You'll actually take your finish backwards and make it micro mark. You will dry up the compound, make it harder to wipe off, and you will create dust that you'll have to clean up. So don't short cycle your, or sorry, don't long cycle for your short cycle product. Understand? That question. Did I lose you? Oh. Question on the long cycle. What's the typical long cycle pass? They can be 20, 30 passes. Now, there is definite user preferences on these. Some people prefer one over the other. You may not know what your preference is, but you probably have a preference because you're, you like certain products and there's compound behavior and that's why you like that product. Personally, I'm a short cycle guy. I like short cycle products, but I use them the way they're supposed to be used. Now, some of you like long cycle products. Totally fine. We're in America, we have choices, 
it's a free country. Pick your compound and use it. So um, I like short, you might like long. I call long cycle compounds making love to people. I'm just sitting there many, many passages. And, but actually climate wise, um, <coughs> some of you might need long cycle products if you're in a hot, dry climate. You might have to use long cycle products. Okay, that's number 12. Going on to number 11, best way to F up or random orbital policy. This one has to do with the pads. So don't prime your pads is a good way to mess up your cut and your finish. Now all polishing pads of any brand of any type, they all need to be primed properly. So what does that mean? It's preparing the pad to do the work. Now some pads will self-prime, but it'll take three or four, five applications to get there. So when a pad is primed, you have what's called peak performance. In other words, the best that that pad can do on cut and finish. You will not get peak performance until you properly prime the pad. So my thinking is, why not get peak performance now? Why wait for that pad to be primed three or four applications later? So here's a little video. We hired some very expensive hand models <laughs> to demonstrate this. But we're going to set the tool to speed number two, and this is on Rupa's tool, speed number two. We are going to apply four pea-sized dots. Some people said, oh, those are big peas. Well, these are Louisiana peas. So four pea-sized dots. You're gonna run the tool for about 30 seconds. Now, 30 seconds is not a lot of time until you have a bunch of people watching you and then it seems like forever. <laughs> but you're gonna leave that tool stationary in one place for 30 seconds. This is not proper use of the tool, this is priming. So the reason you leave it in one place is you are warming up the liquid, you're warming up the foam, and you are getting the liquid to spread thin and even across the pad. So when you see the liquid starting to spread across the surface, that is when you have begun the priming. So this is proper pad priming. And until you do this, you will not get peak performance. So prime your pads and you'll get better performance. Yes, ma'am. So priming pads, the message is, Get the peak performance now on your first application, not the fourth and fifth one. All right, number 10, best way to F up your random orbital polishing also has to do with pads. Don't swap your pads, meaning swap your pads. So our product, the Rupus brand of pads, they come in two pads. This is our subtle message. <coughs> Take your two pads, do that car, and swap out to a cool pad every other panel or every third panel. But do the car with both pads. If you do a whole car with one pad, you are gradually building up heat inside that pad. And that pad now is going to work uh, less good. Is that what it Less gooder. Less gooder. <laughs> So, less efficient. Less efficient. Um, a cool, clean pad will perform better. So the idea is to swap your pads as you do the car. That's the main message. Uh, and I would say the ultimate in swapping pads is actually have a stack of pads. And do one per panel and keep swapping out the pad. You get the best performance. And by the way, I'm not saying this trying to sell you more pads. This is about performance. If I'm telling you peak performance, this is how you get it. Number nine. The number nine best way to F up your random order of policy also has to do with pads. Don't clean the pad and you will get bad performance. So this is super, super important to any random order of policy, not just Rupus, but any random order of tool any pad that you put on that tool. If you do not clean that pad frequently, 
you will have what's called diminishing returns on performance. That means the more you use it, the less it will cut, the less it will finish. So clean the pads frequently. Somebody might ask, how frequently? Somebody might ask, how frequently? Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm happy to tell you. So a minimum of clean the pad once per panel. So you polish the fender, clean the pad, polish the door, clean the pad, polish the door, clean the pad. So a minimum of once per panel and you will maintain peak performance. So when you, when you don't clean pads, you get what's called pad load, pad load. This is, if you look under a microscope or a magnifying glass, the pad load that's on the paint is a mixture of paint, or sorry, the pad load on the pad is a mixture of paint and compound residue. So, oh, I sound loud now. It's okay with me. I, I want people to hear me in Las Vegas. <laughs> so, um, if you don't clean the pad, you get what's called pad load on the pad. This is paint residue, compound residue, and it looks like that. And when you have this condition on the pad, you will have less cut and worse finishing. So this is super important. The other thing is temperature increases. Because now you're taking cells in the foam and you're filling them with material. You're increasing surface area. Now you're creating more heat, both in the pad and on the paint. Performance decreases and the user, by the way, the user is another way of saying you. So you end up working harder if you don't clean your pads. So that little defect you're going after and you're sitting there trying to do many passes, you may want to clean the pad first and then hit that defect and it'll come out a lot faster. Yes, sir. How do you clean the pad? How? So, Come to our training academy and we will teach you how to clean the 